Good evening to everyone. So my name is Aviwe Mkobozi and I'm a clinical associate by profession and head of the division of clinical associates. It's really such a pleasure to welcome everybody to this session. And these are webinars that we started quite a few years back um, to help students just to link you to professional clinical associates who are already working and they're out in the space. So the sessions are aiming to actually link students to our graduate clinical associates just to hear about the success stories and to hear about what exactly are they getting up to in, in the various workplaces. So I'm going to be your host for today and how the session runs is that we're going to have three guest speakers who are going to share about their journey from graduation up until this point. And we'll listen to all three guests. And at the very end, we're going to have a Q&A um, session. So the aim of these sessions is just to highlight and illuminate all the beautiful stories and the beautiful journeys that our graduates are, are partaking in. And you'll see such diverse roles, such diverse um, job descriptions um, and just also how far the clinical associates have got um, from the time of their own graduation. So it's quite an exciting series. We're going to have them every first Monday of every month. So starting from today and ending in November. And that will be quite a nice series of three guests at a time. So by the end of the year, we would have seen more than even 12 um, guests of clinical associates. Just a little bit about myself um, is that I graduated in the first cohort that's in 2011 and started working in 2012. And from then on, we basically had our own experiences. Being the first group, um, a lot of people ask, what is a clinical associate? What do you do? So I'm hoping that 10 years later, that we're having different types of questions that are being asked and we can actually really have that discussion on these platforms about those questions, about the advances, about the challenges, really about the realities that um, we all face as, as clinical associates. Let me start by introducing our first guest and the order is from recent graduates up until further back. Um, in the years. So Mpumi Makubu is a graduate from the University of Witwatersrand. She graduated in 2017 and she's currently working full time as a clinical associate at Hillbrook Community Health Care Center, which is just around the corner from, from Wits. In 2023, she received a certificate of recognition from the Johannesburg Gauteng Health in Family Medicine. She's part of a nonprofit organization called Dream Foundation, which works to empower young people to establish themselves and reach their dreams. She loves empowering destinies of the youth and actively getting involved in campaigns. She's currently actually doing her honors in emergency medicine here at WITS. So quite a refreshing start um, to start with Mpumi. And over to you Mpumi, I'll just Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I am really grateful and honored to be invited and to share um, with you my, my story as a, as a clinical associate. So I, I graduated truly um, in the class of 20, 2017, um, at WITS, yeah, So just to give you a bit of a a background of like where um, Unumpu Merelo is coming from. So I'm just going to be speaking about the roles of, of a clinical associate um, in a workplace, but mostly focusing on the public sector because, you know, clinical associate can be in a private and a public sector. So just a background of um, where I'm coming from. So I, I was born here in Gauteng. I'm the first person actually to do health sciences in my family. No one has ever done it. Um, I'm the only girl among three brothers. 
And I'm also working full time, full time at um, a Hillbro, Hillbro CHC. So looking at Johannesburg, you know, because Hillbro is located in Johannesburg, Johannesburg carries a, a lot of population, especially with people coming as the central city. So Hillbro Clinic um, can move on to the next slide. Yes, thank you. So Hillbro Clinic usually is sees about a population of people of about four five point eight two people. So also other clinics they refer to us such as Esalen, such as Yeovil Clinic, and we also get referrals from even the general practitioners. So Hillbro usually provides services such as maternity, chronic um, disease management, emergency care. We also have radiological services, um, medical legal cases, na natal services, and even HIV and TB. But now, as you know, um, learning as a clinical associate, we learn a lot, a lot of things. So I'm just going to be focusing on what um, Hillbro does. So looking at Hillbro, we have doctors, we have clinical associates. Currently, Hillbro Clinic has only four has only four clinical associates. While we're looking at, we have about 24, 24 doctors. And this 24 excludes the sessional doctors who come and work in like on weekends during the calls. We can, can move on. So what do we do? Because we cover, clinical associate program covers a variety of topics and, you know, in health. So here, bro, only or mostly the clinical associates that are working there are working at the outpatient department. I work at the outpatient department. I see chronic and acute um, illnesses, which can be patients who have high blood pressures, your diabetes, your COPDs. So they are being seen there. And also I see your acute cases. Mainly, mainly we see adult patients. Pediatric patients, we do see them, but not as often as, as adult patients. We also, I also refer to tertiary hospitals and also secondary hospitals, and as well as ordering um, important investigations that we, we are learning about, we, that you are learning about, which is your x-rays uh, and dipsticks and everything. And mostly also what, what I also do is that I also do some of the emergency, minor em emergency proce procedures as well. Depending on a patient, the patient might come with a fracture, then um, after 24 hours, then they come to OPD, then we also review those patients. There are some clinical associates at Hillbro who are also um, working with um, circumcisions as well. So um, challenges, you know, challenges because um, as you see, um, the picture of a stethoscope. It's because um, mostly clinical associates, we are wearing stethoscopes. Can can you move on to the to the next slide? The most the most frequently question asked is, or the challenge that I have even now is that, are you a doctor? I'm always asked that. I'm always asked, are you a doctor? And I will tell the person, okay, no, I'm a clinical associate. And then they'll tell me, Guti, tell us what is a clinical associate? You know, so that's that's the most challenge that we have. And basically is to always um, voice out that actually I'm a physician's assistant. Actually, um, I'm not a doctor. You know, because the thing is that we wear the same uniform, we wear scrubs, we, we have a stethoscope. So people will actually ask about these things. And also another thing, that's a challenge, it's quantity versus quality. This is in the public sector because most of the time we are we are being asked or you, you will be expected to see a lot of people, but you will be missing a lot of things. What I like about the clinical associate program is that mostly it focuses on many patient areas and not only on the physical aspect, but in a public sector, the challenge is pushing numbers than the golden rule, which is the um, patient quality of care. And also, just to point also other challenges, just to summarize them, is that um, our 
level because our scope of practice says um, we cannot prescribe up, uh, above level four except in emergency cases. So I found out that has been challenges, especially if a physician is not a, is not at work probably at a certain time, then patients need to wait in order for, for the physician to, to, to sign that script. I know at, at the clinic, we don't do pre-signing of the script. Um, usually a script is, is signed in, in that day. So the, those are the some of the challenges as well. So according to Henry Ford, when everything seems to be going against you, Remember that the airplane takes off against the wind, not, not with it. So in this case, I will take clinical as associate as an airplane. You know, all these forces are coming against the profession, but let's see how we can navigate or let's see how I overcame these challenges. So uh, what I understood is that I had to understand myself i had to understand my role before before my profession you know i had to understand that now this profession is mostly built on improving health and improving quality of health rather than just building numbers because if we are just building numbers or treating patients or treating volumes without quality, we end up missing and losing a lot of things. So basically, as we, as you all know that a patient can present with an illness due to biological, psycholo psychological or social things. So how I overcame that by valuing the quality is to focus on the key aspects of why the patient presents today. In terms of if it's a social problem, then broadening it, it that and making it more than only giving the patient panado because if we, we if i treat the biological aspect i might miss what the patient is presenting with today so also another thing that hopefully in the future will help us is to is the amendment of the scope of practice because it was last reviewed in 2016 you know, and the now clinical associates are doing a lot of things. Some of clinical associates are even um, playing the roles of doctors or physicians in their practices. So what will help us is the amendment and also some of the drug schedules so that patients won't have to wait um, a long time in order for them to get help. OK, so um, personal achievement, as as mentioned, we are being recognized, you know, it might because it's from the first graduate who graduated in 2011. Um, now it's about, I think, 13 or 12 years. You know, we are we are still moving slowly, but surely we will get there. So um, there was there was an event of um, achievement giving at um, the Johannesburg City Re region last year usually when those events come honestly i i always say oh it's just for doctors you know i always say oh, it's just for doctors i was not even there at the event but clinical associates are being recognized i was recognized um um representing clinical associates so um, i'm really grateful for that and as i'm doing honors honors now also another thing that i'm grateful for is that because I'm I'm working full time, you know, I'm working full time and they are allowing me to study while I do emergency calls. Because many people who wanted to study while working full time, they had to res resign. Because how can you work full time and still study? So that's that's a personal achievement for me. I'm I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, so those are the two things that I'm that I'm grateful for. Okay, so I'm done. Take home message. Take home message. I know you are adversity, but just know that success is steps. You cannot just jump to step five if you have not started to, in step one. So what I've learned is that usually I know when you arrive at varsity, it's that hype, you know, the new environment and everything is is very very nice so the foundational thing that i've learned is that take everything seriously whatever you learn even from first year that's how important it is because the clinical associate program now is only three years 
So in those three years, you must capture them, you must prioritize them because those three years are a foundation in order for you to go and work in a field. So if we miss to capitalize those three years, it's gonna be it's gonna be really a waste and a ch and a challenge. So that's what I've learned um, to take home message is that especially if you're doing your first year or second year, prioritize those those primary because they will build up into making you to become more successful. Ask more questions now. It's it will help you a lot. It will save you a lot. Don't say um your question is. It, don't think your question is foolish or whatsoever. Ask a lot now. And also another thing, in any profession, don't be moved by money. Because even billionaires or even millionaires, they still want to build up and make more than what they are owing now. So don't say you're going to do this profession or you're going to do that profession just because that profession has a lot of money. The basic thing is to follow your passion. Is to follow your passion, follow what you love and money will follow after because if the way weighing the values passion always outweighs whatever you you come come about in life so develop also other aspects of your life as you're in varsity also know what are your interests develop also other aspects of your life and also the the reason why i pointed there your health because it's very very important you know make sure that you take care of your mental health, um, of your physical health, as well as your um, um, emotional or psycho spiritual health. Like every aspect of your life is very, very important in order for you to, to take the services, in order for you to help other people. Yes, so thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mbumi. There, there's a round of applause. If we could hear the sound and this heart, thank you so much for, for sharing. Thank you for the reactions. Um, yes, so from my side, I mean, thank you so much. I think one of the recipes for success is to actually take ownership of your own journey. And you can see from Mbumi, who's working at a clinic, um, for people who want to work in a clinic, she's sharing from her perspective how to navigate it. There is a balance of, you know, success aspects and at the same time, the challenges that are faced throughout by, by clinical associates. So I, I don't want to get into the nitty gritties there. If you have any questions or comments, please leave it in the chat space. Then we'll come back um, to some of those areas where you want to probe a little further or have a discussion in, in that area. But thank you so much. Let's move to the next speaker. So the next speaker is Zintle. Zintle graduated from WITS in 2015. 15. And she's, yeah. 15. she's passionate about healthcare quality, health system strengthening, and improvement in healthcare systems. She's a mental health advocate, and she's currently pursuing a career in clinical psychology. The reason why she took the opportunity to share her journey is to help students to know and be proud that we are a distinct and unique breed of healthcare professionals, meeting a specific and integral need in the healthcare system. We are not to be compared ourselves. We are not to compare ourselves with other healthcare professionals, um, but rather to identify um, within our own group. So over to you, Zintle. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to greet um, everyone on this call, our departmental heads, our students, fellow colleagues, clinical associates. Um, I know we have, you know, a, a wide range of an audience here. We have newly graduated, probably clinical associates. We've got veterans like myself, Avio and Mateen. And we have, you know, people that may be aspiring to even study towards a BCMP degree that are looking for answers and want to really know what to expect in the program. What are the opportunities for growth? 
So I was so thankful to be offered the opportunity to speak on this platform because it acts as, you know, a platform for learning, for sharing, for inspiring others and for showing them that, you know, showing um, the upcoming clinical associates that things aren't as bad as they seem. I know there's a lot of negative stories. Um, there's a lot of good stories as well, but it's good to just, you know, hear bits and pieces from, from a lot of people so that you can gather your own, um, you know, unique and distinct journey and just to find yourself in this program and to better yourself towards um, making a footprint on a personal level and on a program level as clinical associates. You know, we have found ourselves in a place where we have a lot to prove. So these platforms are, are nice platforms for learning. So again, I'd like to thank you, Aviwe, for inviting me to speak here. Um, so as, as um, Aviwe had introduced me, my name is Zinglem Shongo. I graduated from um, WITS um, in 2015 as a clinical associate, um, and currently I'm working for a continuous quality improvement coordinator under the Voluntary Medical Male Circumcision Program, which is a very popular program. And many clinical associates have been able to make their footprints and grow, you know, in this field. Um, this is mostly funded by NGOs, so I will uh, be representing the NGO space. I know Nomfu was um, representing mostly the healthcare space, but I'll speak to mostly what to expect in an NGO, uh, specifically referring to my own journey. So here it goes, um, my outline, I'll just do that. That was my introduction and my icebreaker. I'll go deep dive into my journey, the impacts and programs I've supported, some of the lessons that I've learned that I'd like to share with upcoming clinical associates so they don't really need to struggle and fall as much as we did, but just to gear them up and get them prepared for the great journey ahead. Some opportunities as well as a clinical associates um, that colleagues or students may want to consider and um, the way forward and closure of the session. So um, my eight, in my eight-year journey as a clinical associate, um, first and foremost, I had to undergo the training, which was a three-year training at Wits University. And afterwards, I, um, you know, moved on to becoming a clinical associate straight after graduation. I worked for the National Department of Health in the clinic. Um, which also had its challenges, and I think uh, Nompomelelo covered it so well um, in the context of, 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 of um, working in the Department of Health. Thereafter, I worked in private practice. Um, thereafter, my journey just, you know, took a sharp turn. And I was employed as a clinical associate, a VMMC clinical associate, what people like to term as a cutter. I don't really like that term <laughs> because we are clinicians at that space. We are not butchers. We are not cutters. But yeah, I was a clinical associate and uh, for a certain NGO um, in KZN in Itseguini. And then from there, you know, I grew um, in the program um, because I was very open to learning, open to growth. I was then um, promoted. Um, to becoming a clinical um, coordinator. And then thereafter, I moved on um, to an organization called um, GSI, where, where I was a secure advisor. And then I moved on to becoming a provincial um, coordinator. And um, currently I'm working as a VMMC CQI coordinator um, for the coastal regions, which is um, KZN, Eastern Cape, um, and um, the Western Cape. Uh, all under the VMMC program. So you can see the different stages of growth. It wasn't an overnight thing that happened, but it was years and years of service, years and years of dedication, of growth, of hard work, and of opening myself to learning, you know, um, which is the journey of each and every one of us on this call. We will start somewhere and we will end somewhere, but it's just those continued efforts and dedication towards our growth at each and every step. So I'll just give an outline of my job. I know I've been saying the word CQI a lot, and I know most people on this call may not know what is CQI. Some may have an idea, but I'll just give a slight idea of the context of quality improvement in VMMC. So my job um, as a, a CQI coordinator is to lead a team of clinical and supporting staff in ensuring um, um, quality in the VMMC program, which is voluntary male medical circumcision in the NGO space. Our goal is to continually assess 
identify gaps and put and, and put in uh, measurable solutions, appropriate solutions, which are implemented, you know, by the people that are actually doing the circumcision um, at site level. And we also ensure that all of the interventions at site levels, all of the procedures, all of the circumcisions, the documentation, the processes, that everything aligns to the Department of Health, the World Health Organization, as well as the American funders, which are mainly the PEFO and the CDC. Um, that are investing their funds towards ensuring that um, male medical circumcision is effective in ensuring the reduced transmission of HIV in the male population. Um, you know, all of these are, are, are just um, certain, you know, roles that we play on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that everything that we do and every healthcare intervention that is done within the circumcision program is aligning to the standards and that our patients are safe. So um, why did I choose quality improvement? Um, I'm an all-rounder. I'm a person that's an all-rounder. I believe in ensuring um, the holistic health care of our clients. And we know that of late, um, male medical circumcision is now transitioning to a platform for men's health care. So this is a, it, it acts as a gateway for males to access health care. We know that males are mostly reluctant, you know, into taking medication, going to the clinic. So when they go to the circumcision and we find that there's something is, is wrong with them, we are able to link them to the specific care. If they're HIV positive, we link them for HIV treatment. If they're negative, we, we educate on, on, on abstin uh, abstinence, being faithful and condomizing to prevent HIV and just implementing the preventative um, aspect of, 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 of circumcision and just ensuring that our strategies are holistic in the healthcare of men. So that is the reason why I chose quality improvement to ensure that I'm impacting, um, you know, um, the lives of the, of, of the space that I work in in a positive manner as an all-rounder. So my job is a very critical job, a critical role in this program to ensure that all of that falls into place accordingly. So in terms of my journey, impacts and programs, so in my journey, the HA journey that I just um, presented previously, I was able to pioneer continuous quality improvement digital tools. I was able to um, um, also implement social, uh, social behavioral change campaigns and projects um, through certain projects that we did. We're able to lead some of these, develop guidelines, develop training materials, put in infection prevention control manuals and tools and form part of funder level quality improvement platforms. So um, all of this that I'm sharing now is not just to air, you know, achievements and all of those things, not at all, but it's just to demonstrate the fact to new and upcoming clinical associate students and clinical associates who are just starting up in their career that our success as humans is not a project that will only last a short period of time, but it's a journey which could take a, a turn at each and every point of our lives. So we need to be very strategic and very intentional about our growth, about our development from the early stages, from the, you know, from the point of being a student. We need to internalize that we are on a journey of learning and we will continue to develop continuously until we reach until we reach a stage where we feel like our impact has been able to touch the lives of many um because uh, any career in healthcare is a is a career in ensuring um, the improvement of people's lives, people's health holistically, not only on a clinical level. I know, you know, in school we emphasize the biopsychosocial um, um, methodology, which ensures that we are dealing with the whole man. So whatever we do as clinical associates, we need to ensure that our impact is felt by our communities. As you know, that we have a we are a new program and we have a points to prove. Um, to the Department of Health, um, to, to, to organizations that are opening themselves up to clinical associates. So this demonstration and everything that I've shared is just to inspire people, to let them know that there is growth, but it's not something that will come overnight. We need to dedicate ourselves to learning at each and every step. So some of the programs that we've been able to implement, this was all under the male medical circumcision programs. There were other programs we were able to do. Here you see there at the right, um, uh, at the top left, um, we, were doing, uh, we were doing some trainings on infection prevention control, not just on voluntary male medical circumcisions, but we were able to reach out 
to healthcare workers in, 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 I think it was almost 160 clinics in KZN, we were able to train them on infection prevention control and ensuring a sterile, you know, and, and, and clean environment when they are doing their own procedures and their day-to-day -day work, um, you know, in their separate fields. So we're able to, to gather some general assistance and donate um, some items to assist them and to improve healthcare. Um, some of these are, are outreaches uh, where we were speaking after the floods, we we're able to distribute here on the bottom left. You can see here we were distributing, you know, some materials to reach out to people after the KZN floods came in. We we're able to intervene on a social level to ensure that our communities are safe. Um, there in the red um, was one of our PEPFAR visits. Um, where we had our funders visiting us just to see how our program is doing. And all around, you can just see um, the societal impact and the work that we have done throughout to ensure that our communities aren't only taken care on a medical level, clinical level, but to ensure the all round, you know, healthy uh, uh, human being. Um, so I just have a quote here by William Jennings Bryan. It talks about service being the measure, of, uh, is the measure of greatness and it, all, and it has always been true. It is true today and it will always be true that he is, he is greatest who does the most of good. Nearly all of our controversies and combats grow out of the fact that we are trying to get something from each other. There will be peace when our aim is to do something for each other. The human measure of a human life is its outcome. The divine measure of, of a life is its outgoal, its outflow, is its contribution to the welfare of all. So as clinical associates, I emphasized earlier on that our career is a career of service to our communities. And we need to have a passion for this. So in whatever we do, um, we need to ensure that we are always growing, but our outflow is from what we are, you know, is from our growth and how much we can contribute to our communities and healthcare systems as well. Um, so these are some statistics. I won't go through them, but it just shows how important clinical associates are in the National Department of Health. We see here there's a critical shortage of doctors. You know, there's a critical shortage of nurses. Um, there's a shortage of skilled uh, skilled professionals, and by 2025, it is said to be around 97,000. And you know, in mental health, more specifically, 90% of South Africans are unable to access healthcare on a daily basis, and that men are less likely than women to use health services. So why am I um, displaying these statistics? It's just to show that there is a need for clinical associates. There is a market, but as clinical associates, we need not really focus on the conventional ways in which we can serve our communities, but we need to be very, you know, um, be very strategic, you know, think out of the box, um, work as groups, you know, work together to form organization programs, make a tangible change in our communities. And as I've said before, that that we are a new profession and we are trying to make our footprint and we have a lot to prove. So um, as we continue to grow, uh, we can grow into ensuring that we are addressing these gaps and addressing all of these healthcare shortages that we are seeing, you know, lack of access through in these um, stars. I just put health system strengthening initiatives, which would be prevention, such as male medical circumcision, education, men's health initiatives, and also everything that I've just demonstrated on the image prior. So these are just some statistics highlighting the disease burden. We see there at the top, the leading cause of death in South Africa is TB, followed by influenza and pneumonia. And we can see that this really demonstrates that there is a need, but we need to focus on innovation, focus on growth, focus on societal impact, and focus on, on innovative strategies to, 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 to create that impact in our communities. Because as I have emphasized before, that our career is a career of service, and if we want to grow and thrive and also be fulfilled personally. It is by ensuring that we are reaching out to our communities through strategic interventions, personal growth, um, and creating the, the right networks and surrounding ourselves with clinical associate uh, platforms and individuals that are sharing the same visions as us.
So I, I just have a quote here by Michael McMillian. It says, for every problem, there exists a solution. And at the very least, there is an opportunity. So everything that I've listed before, the issue with TB, the healthcare burden, the shortages, shows us that there is a world of opportunity for us for growth and for establishment as, as clinical associates. But it starts at the point where we realize that we need to become more innovative. We need to seek ways that are unconventional so that we can make a, a footprint in this in our society. Um, I've just charted down some opportunities and career paths that clinical associates can 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 chart. Um, we have emergency medicine. We have you know public health specialists through the public um, health um, masters in public health programs, project management, training and ed education, clinical research, private practice, health system strengthening. You know HIV prevention programs, business administration, and mental health, which is you know my heart's love and my main interest. So what are the lessons that I've learned um, over the eight years in which I've been practicing is to always posture myself for continuous growth. I must, we must never get to a phase where we feel as clinical associates we have reached the peak of, of, of our performance or the peak of what we can do, but we must always internalize the process of growth. And the most important thing and the most Im impactful thing is to be part of a network of clinical associates so that we can grow and learn from each other and also be open you know, to opportunities that may arise through fellow clinical associates. That's why I love this platform that we are on now. Um, and the other one is to be open to mentorship. Um, very, very important. You need to have someone that is ahead of you, that is coaching you, that is leading you, and that is showing you some of the do's, some of the don'ts. This will help you to avoid um, many mistakes, loss of time. You know, this can be a fe fellow clinical associate, alumni, a lecturer, and career coaches as well. And to expose ourselves to every learning opportunities, webinars, short courses, formal courses, diplomas, all of those things, we need to ensure that um, we are opening ourselves to growth. And most importantly, we need to take a leadership course. Being the pioneers of this program, um, you know, we need to ensure that we our leadership skills are, are sharpened and heightened so that when opportunity comes for leadership in a certain organization, in a hospital, in a clinic, we can step up with tangible skill that we have developed. And the most imp another important thing is to be eloquent, to be able to speak to what to do, always be ready to represent the BCMP program in whichever field you choose to pursue. And um, we need to learn to build a professional, a, a good professional track record. You know, this is ensuring that in every role that you get as a clinical associate, you do your best so that your references can speak to you. The people that you worked for can speak to you. Um, your lecturers at schools can speak to a certain individual being a star student. And it starts now. And this builds you up for a career of success. And we need to be always be ready to go the extra mile. Um, I think in my growth, I learned that, um, you know, these are the greatest opportunities to learn. And most of the time, when you do the things that no one else wants to do, you get to learn what everyone else does not get to learn. So by taking up those things, by taking two extra client uh, patients at the end of the day, when everyone is wanting to leave work, you are reaching out to a family, a community, and you are making a change. And that is the heart of service in, 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 in healthcare. Um, find what you love and be the best at it. Never stop learning and improving. Surround yourself with winners and con and continually challenge yourself. And also be intentional about building st strategic relationships. Um, I've come to the end of my presentation and I'm just going to close with a very um, amazing quote um, from um, Manu Shafiq, um, which says, in the past, jobs are about muscles. Now they are about brains. But in the future, they'll be about the heart. So whatever we do as clinical associates in our growth, in our maturity, and in our learning, we are to make sure that we are passionate about what we are doing. We are passionate to reaching out to our communities and improving healthcare and making our global footprint as clinical associates. Thank you. Zintle, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. You you filling us up, filling us up with good, good um, energy. That was such a an inspiring and also practical talk, which is really much appreciated. Uh, we need to be hearing your stories, hearing the success stories, but the lived stories, because it means that it's possible 
um, for someone else is possible for a student. Um, thank you. I'm excited for the questions and the comments that will come. Um, I'm just going to ask that we move on to the next speaker. Um, that's Martine. Oli, I think I saw a hand up. Please save the questions and the comments for after the last speaker. We will get to we'll get to you. So introducing Martin. Martin graduated from the University of Witwatersrand in 2013. She is a clinical associate in interventional radiology at um, Donald Gordon Medical Center that's in Parktown here in Johannesburg. And she's been working for the, the, the unit for almost a year. She has published as a co-author of three papers and she's always been an advocate for the profession. She's also been closely linked to PACASA, which is the Association for Clinical Associates. She advocates for her patients and always strives to give her best. So Martine is quite sporty. She says I must add this aspect and enjoys participating in running, cycling, swimming, and triathlon events. Her favorite race has been the Portugal Half Ironman in October 2022. And she's currently training for the Two Oceans Half Marathon which is coming up in, in April. All the best, Martin. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm just gonna start sharing my presentation. So um, thank you Aviwe for the wonderful introduction um, and to our previous speakers, you guys were amazing and you have actually inspired me a little bit as well. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so as a viewer said, I am a clinical associate working in interventional radiology, and I will get into that after a little bit more about me. Um, so yes, I graduated from WITS, um, part of the class of 2013. Um, I then unfortunately, after graduation, was unemployed and only managed to find employment in 2016, uh, where I was a clinical associate and research assistant working at the Chris Harney Baragwanath Academic Hospital. Um, I worked between two departments, which was pediatric surgery and pediatric orthopedics, uh, where there was a very steep learning curve because Unfortunately, we can't learn everything um, and in BCMP, we didn't focus on a number of the things that I saw um, and it definitely opened my eyes to to the world. Um, and then after that, I moved on to working at uh, Vitz Donald Gordon Medical Center and I was employed by Vitz Health Consortium. I started out in the colorectal unit and I worked there for two years. And as we all know, um, COVID struck and surgery took a major backseat. Um, and I actually volunteered to be part of the COVID unit um, where you can imagine the crazy things that we saw. Um, so I worked in COVID and our urgent care unit for also about two years. And then I moved on to medical oncology where I worked for about a year as well. Um, and then in May last year, I started working at DGMC Radiology, uh, which is still at uh, the Donald Gordon Medical Center. Um, yeah, so I'm the first clinical associate in our department. Um, I only know of one other person who's working in interventional radiology. They're currently based at Mill Park. Um, I'm not sure who she is, but I've heard very good things about her. Um, and yeah, just so that you know, my daily tasks, which are clinical, uh, I work with other clinical associates that are based at Donald Gordon in various different units. Um, and I also liaise and collaborate directly with those managing clinicians for our best patient care. And then in terms of procedures, what I do is um, ultrasound guided procedures and fluoroscopic guided procedures. Um, the main things that I do at this moment in time are thoracentesis for viral effusions, uh, paracentesis for, for ascites. I do line insertions, um, so patients who have difficult veins and need cannulation for CT scans, I do ultrasound guided drips for them. Um, I do midline insertions. A midline is just basically a big drip. Um, I do central venous catheters, and then I do something called a pick line, which is a peripherally inserted central catheter. And then I insert something called a pigtail drain, um, which 
majority of the time I've inserted into pleural effusions or ascites. And then our fluoroscopic procedures, this is obviously not limited to what we can do, but this is what I've been doing. Um, I do lumbar punctures, uh, pigtail insertions and removals. Um, patients that have had these into their pleural effusions, or ascites, or if they've had a nephrostomy, um, or in an abscess or collection. And then I have some administrative tasks, which consist of booking patients for interventional procedures, such as biopsies or ablations, um, and any number of things that the patients need to come for. Um, and then on occasion, I also do some letters of motivation. Um, and this is mainly for medical aids, um, patients who maybe are on a lower plan and they need a little bit more explanation as to why the patient needs a certain procedure or why the patient needs to have it done under general anesthetic, for example. Um, and then just some miscellaneous things. Um, I do follow up of patients that are in the ward that have had procedures. Um, I do telephonic uh, phone calls with them as well, just to see how they're doing. And then often the radiologists will ask, ask for a hand um, with some of the other procedures and I'll lend a hand. And then these are just a couple of pictures that I decided to share. Um, so I'll start from the left hand side. Uh, there you can see me in the top left corner in my lead apron. Uh, as you know, working in radiology exposes you to radiation, um, albeit in small doses, but it's on a daily basis. So we as radiation workers have to make sure that we protect ourselves um, from the radiation. Um, and that particular day I was in theatre just observing as I just recently started. Uh, then on the bottom left hand corner, uh, Dr. Prince and I were doing a procedure in our medical ICU and that was for a patient that had a very large uh, pleural effusion. And if you look at the bottom right hand corner, um, that's actually our before and after picture. Um, so you can see the large effusion over here and then this is after the drainage. You can see the, the pigtail in the, the little base of the, the lung over there. And then the middle picture um, is myself and Dr. Prince doing a drainage procedure for a patient that needed a really large drain um, put into an abdominal collection. Um, and Dr. Prince was actually my assistant in this procedure, even though he was the one teaching me. Um, and this patient also needed a PIC line. Um, yeah, so that was quite a, a cool procedure to be a part of. And then the top right hand corner is our interventional team, uh, missing one lady, unfortunately. Um, but I'll start from the left and to the right of the picture. Uh, that's Dr. Daniel Prince. He's one of our interventional radiologists. Um, there's Dr. John Cantrell, who is also an interventional radiologist. Uh, the lady in the pink is Mandy. She is our head radiographer for interventional radiology and has a wealth of experience in this field. Um, she's actually my manager in the department. Um, and then you can see myself in the middle. And then next to me is Hydra. She is also a radiographer who works in interventional radiology. And Victor, another radiographer working in interventional radio uh, radiology. And then last but definitely not least is Dr. Charles Sanika. He is literally the father of interventional radiology on the continent. Um, he is an incredible person to work with and has an absolute wealth of knowledge. Um, he's been a big supporter uh, since I joined the department and Prior to my joining the department, um, he's been a big supporter of uh, clinical associates and yeah, definitely an amazing person to work with. And if ever you need anything in interventional radiology, he is definitely your go to guy. Um, and this is just uh, some pictures of the fluoroscopic procedures. Uh, that I do. So as you can see on the left hand side, there's a little clip of uh, the needle going into the spinal canal uh, for a lumbar puncture. And the reason why this patient needed to have the lumbar puncture done under fluoroscopic guidance is because, as you can see, a lumbar surgery and the neurologist was concerned that he may not get into that space. Um, 
And then the picture on the right um, is an elderly patient. As you can see, the discs are quite uh, degenerated. Um, and yeah, that's the needle almost in the exact spot where it needs to be. Um, and then this is just a picture of Dr. Sanika and the team doing what we call cryoablation. Um, and this particular case was for a renal cell carcinoma. Um, and just on a side note, uh, Donald Gordon was the first uh, facility to perform one of these procedures in the country. Um, so it's really great to be working with such a, a groundbreaking uh, unit as well. Um, and then just some challenges. Obviously, everybody has them. Um, the learning curve was really steep because, as I'm sure you guys know, you do procedures basically blind um, and you don't have the luxury of ultrasound or fluoroscopy to do these procedures and you learn how to do them a certain way um, and then you have to learn how to do them another way. So, you know, going from doing plural taps and ascites drainages previously when I was a student, um, we would go in blind and obviously, you know, you learn your anatomic marks um, so that you make sure that you're not injuring the patients whilst you're doing these procedures. Um, and then when it comes to doing it with ultrasound, then you can understand why it should be done with ultrasound. That's obviously the gold standard. Um, so that was quite difficult to try and learn how to hold the ultrasound probe in the one hand and actually perform the procedure in your other hand. Um, as you guys know, patients often only want the doctor. Um, and how I've managed to overcome that is uh, that our doctors are often very busy in theatre doing major interventional procedures um, and patients after I've performed the procedure actually are like, oh, wow, you know, can I book with you next time? Um, so I definitely say that that's also one of my work achievements is that patients actually are my returning customers and they ask specifically for me when they book these procedures. Um, just in terms of anatomy, patients, obviously, you don't, not one person is the same. Um, and often the patients that we have as a, at our facility have come from other hospitals. They've had a lot of interventions before um, and they end up having difficult or varied anatomy. Um, and that can make the procedure a lot more challenging. So already you're learning to do something and you then get difficult anatomy, which makes it even more challenging. Um, and then working with different uh, personalities within the work environment. Um, as you know, people have different personalities and they have different backgrounds, different upbringings. Uh, we're not all from the same healthcare field and you have to make sure that you do it for the greater good of the patients and not to let different personalities um, affect your working environment and how you work with the patients. And then at our facility, because we are a private institution um, and we are also the only academic private hospital in the country, there's a very high expectation for the quality of work that we provide. Um, there's also quite a large patient volume. So even though there are three radiologists that I work with and then myself, so that makes four of us who can do interventional procedures, um, there are is quite a high patient volume and we need to try and obviously turn that volume over in a reasonable time. And then for me personally um, is that I always try to be perfect um, but you can't always be perfect because of external factors like patients with difficult anatomy. Um, so you, sometimes you have to just take a step back, um, introspect and say okay this was my challenge for the day and I'm going to overcome it because, as we know, the more you practice, the better you get. And then just in closing, um, I'd like to say that as students, as qualified clinical associates, whether you're working in a rural facility or a, a private facility, you need to be able to do what you can with what you have. Um, always be the best version of yourself and always put your patients first um, and have fun.
you can't go to work and just think of it as a job. You need to enjoy what you're doing. You need to enjoy the environment that you're working in and honestly just make the most of it. Um, and then as our previous speakers have also uh, mentioned, I'd just like to echo it. Make sure that you look after your health, whether it's your physical, mental or spiritual health. Um, and then just a last quote, be there for others, but never leave yourself behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I hope you saw the, the hearts, the applauds uh, that was coming through. Thank you so much for, for sharing. It's such an exciting space. I had never actually thought of it um, for a clinical associate. So thank you for just enlightening us and, and sharing your, your success stories and, and lived experience as well. Um, thank you for sharing. Really, really, it was inspiring. And you, you all in different spaces, which is always so interesting. And it shows how dynamic a clinical associate is. And one thing that stood out for me is really about having a growth mindset. That we should wake up and we should look out for opportunity, look out for how to better ourselves, how to, you know, enhance our knowledge, our skills um, within our clinical settings or our settings. And always remember that the patient is at the core of, of what we do. So quality healthcare is at the core of why we even practicing. So thank you, thank you, ladies. I truly appreciate it. And I'm sure everyone who joined does appreciate it. Perhaps I can, Zintle, if I can ask you a question, what sort of opportunities have you taken to help you along in your path? Thank you so much um, for that, Aviwe. So in terms of my postgrad, um, I mentioned a bit earlier on that I'm pursuing a, a career towards um, psychology. So my true love is clinical psychology, but in the area of continuous quality improvement, it is definitely um, some courses through FPD and through the various training platforms to um, improve in my skill and quality assurance and quality improvement tools. Um, so in the area of growth, I focus mainly on charting a career towards um, the psychology, but also um, doing some project management uh, courses that I've done a couple on project management so that I can, um, you know, manage the program and the pro uh, project better. So it's just short courses here and there, but um, the main um, study point has been psychology thus far. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's always important to sort of think about our skill sets that we collect along the way, because that actually builds on the bigger uh, capabilities. How did you deal with employment seeking? Shall we do maybe one round and then we shall close? Let's start Martin, Zintle and then Bumi. Um, so basically for me, um, it was about networking because I was a private student, so I wasn't in line for a government post when I graduated. Um, just so that you guys know, I didn't sit at home and do nothing when I was unemployed. Um, I actually worked with a plastic surgeon and assisted him in theatre once or twice a week for quite a while. Um, and then I also went and did something totally different where I did learn to swim coaching. Um, but yeah, basically it was all about networking. Um, I met the right person at the right time and he was the one who managed to get me into Barra in that research clinical associate space. Um, and I'm ever so grateful for that because that then led to me networking with someone else who worked or whose husband is the head of the colorectal unit. Um, and she got me in touch with him and that's how I ended up getting into Donald Gordon. Um, and then obviously with being at Donald Gordon since 2018 up until now, it's quite a long time and I've interacted with a number of people within the hospital. Um, pretty much everybody knows me there. So yeah, again, it's just about networking, um, making that connection with people so that they know who you are. Yeah, thanks, Martin. And you, you make a really good point. It goes all the way down to when you're a student, even in your clinical rotations, your behavior, your attitude, your, you know, the relationships and your interactions they are all starting to form that foundation of that, that networking experience and how people see you as an individual. Thank you for that. Um, Zintle? 
Thank you so much. I was just shaking my head in agreement, you know, with both Martin and yours insights um, with regards to that. But I definitely say networking is the best thing and also just always showing up your best, uh, put your best foot forward in everything you do. Be professional, be a leader and be ready to do. You know, I, I said before that you need to be ready to do what no one else is ready to do. Be able to learn, be flexible and build a network. Other clinical associates, colleagues, old colleagues, just make sure that you never um, block certain, you know, individuals or, or groups or certain spaces out of your growth so that even if you do have a period where you have to take one or two locums here and there, because as we said before, it's a journey. Sometimes you'll find yourself doing some locums for a certain period until you can find something stable. But just have that, you know, that hope, that passion that you will make it, you will succeed and the doors will open for you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Zinke. And last but not least, the most recent graduate, but not so recent because it's been quite a few years for me. <laughs> um, yes, just to answer the question, um, with my experience, um, after graduating in 2017, uh, there were posts around the Johannesburg City region for CAs. And mm. then I interviewed in 2018. Two years, they didn't call me. So it really takes patience. Um, but also like in those in that time while you're still waiting, you you go to GPs, you assist, and then they might open up for you. And then two years after line, I got a call from um Gauteng Department of Health saying that I've been appointed. So it really takes patience, although doors might not open, but find things to do and develop yourself. Yes. Mm. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that guidance. Do you only work at rural hospitals? I can answer that quickly. Um, Kensani, no. So clinical associates can work uh, in the rural setting, but also in the private setting or peri-urban um, setting, not only and limited to the rural hospitals. I hope that that answers you. Thank you so much to everyone. Please have a good evening. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and we appreciate the guests for joining us this evening. Good night to everyone.